Okay. All right, thanks. Uh, am I introducing myself? Please do, Professor. We okay. had technical problems earlier on. That is why we went through your program. Okay. <laughs> All right. thank, you. thank you so much for this. All right. So uh, I'm uh, Professor Rob Simmons. I'm, I'm on the wrong camera. So it all up to nice and then uh, <laughs> everything went wrong. Um, and so I'm, I'm Professor Rob Simmons. Uh, I uh, am uh, the Associate Director uh, of IDEA in, church, in charge of uh, uh, technology initiatives um, and uh, also acting director at the moment. And I'm CTO of uh, the Alufu uh, cluster system. Uh, and uh, yeah, I've been in uh, South Africa for uh, six years now. Previously, I was working in Canada. So this is a little overview of the talk. Uh, talk about uh, why you would want infrastructure as a service cloud. Hopefully everyone knows that now. Uh, it wasn't so clear uh, when, when I started in this game. Um, talk about how uh, a UFU cluster started out. Um, as a system called uh, uh, ARC, African Research Cloud, which turned out to be a very controversial name, but uh, I didn't name it, so there you go. And then say how we've built the cluster out over time, uh, the current status and different uh, systems projects that are in progress uh, and our future plans. So, Elifu uh, is a, a, an OpenStack cluster uh, and it's hosted uh, at the University of Cape Town. Uh, which uh, is, is in uh, a nice uh, machine room there. Uh, and uh, UCT uh, provides uh, the hosting facility and uh, the power and cooling. So uh, that's a, a big cost saver to the project. And it primarily is supporting astronomy and bioinformatics uh, researchers. Um, there are some other projects, uh, but uh, we basically work and support people based around how our funding uh, is, is set up. Um, and we also use it for hosting hackathons and uh, research uh, schools. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we like to do um, outreach um, and uh, IDEA actually has a, 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 uh, a, 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 one of the executives is in, in charge of uh, of outreach and collaboration programs. And so it's an important thing to us. And then much of the work is, is supporting Meerkat and Meerlik telescope data processing. Um, and uh, you know, our idea is a, an astronomy group, so we're hosting it. Uh, but we also have, uh, we have big contributions to the project from um, bioinformatics. Uh, and so um, the SAGE-3A Bionet project uh, is a big user. And that, that was mentioned in terms of uh, the uh, uh, COVID uh, work earlier. And so I'm sure you know about Meerkat. It's uh, uh, a big radio telescope that um, uh, is out uh, in, in the desert. And um, it is going to be the core of uh, SKA-1, um, uh, mid and so it, it, there's there's two SK telescopes, one in one here in, in South Africa and one in, in Australia. And uh, the speaker from Australia earlier was talking about uh, what goes on in the Causey Centre. But uh, yeah, we're, we're we're involved in uh, the uh, in in the mid telescope there in our lower frequency telescope. And then Mirlit um, is a telescope, uh, an optical telescope that tracks um, the uh, Meerkat. And so that means that um, if you're looking at transients, uh, it's, it's very good at being able to um, get both radio images and, uh, and optical images uh, and, and, and compare them. And so all of the Mirlik data actually comes to uh, uh, Ilifu each night. And uh, yeah, the number of users, uh, it's not huge compared to a, a national organization <laughs> such as Nectar, uh, but uh, it's increasing over time. Um, so hopefully you know why why IIS uh, infrastructure as a service is a, is a good idea. It's easy to uh, set up uh, environments, uh, software stacks, uh, using um, tailored to particular applications and uh, particular use cases. Um, and it usually uses virtual machines to encapsulate environments. 
um, as, as was mentioned in, in the NEPTA talk, um, you know, container-based environments uh, are increasingly being used and, and they uh, and uh, they, they encapsulate uh, an application, but uh, uh, they don't encapsulate a whole software stack and they don't give, currently at least, give the same level of separation, I, I think, as, as various things in the hardware being done. Uh, but, but, you know, an infrastructure as a service cloud can mix provisioning of virtual machines, containers, uh, and bare metal. And so, you know, the, the, the problem, a problem with using uh, virtual machines is that uh, uh, they're not very, not so good for hosting scale out um, uh, MPI programs that, that are closely coupled uh, for, for, for various reasons. Uh, they introduce some jitter and, uh, and just getting, utilizing the full bandwidth is, is, is harder. So where this project started is that uh, uh, UCT and Northwest University um, uh, had a project back in 2015, or at least it was set up in, two, the machine was set up in 2015, the project started just before then, and they had just a very, uh, a, a small uh, compute and storage system at UCT and uh, uh, object storage at, uh, at Northwest University, and they were used for, for various different purposes, but um, I think the, the big thing is that uh, it, it was a, a very good learning experience uh, for, for um, the people here. And then um, IDEA uh, uh, had funding from, from its partners um, and it built on the core services provided by ARC. So we didn't go off and have to buy new controller systems and, and all the complexity that, uh, that you want in the background to provide fault tolerance in, in these systems. Um, and so basically we were able to add um, computer nodes. Um, we also added some POSIX storage, which uh, is, is not very cloud-like, uh, but at the time uh, that was uh, the, the best solution we could find to get the high performance we needed. Um, and this cluster uh, used the, what was then new uh, ethernet um, uh, cluster uh, uh, switches, uh, and so they're made by Melnox, who are the, the same people who, who make um, InfiniBand switches, um, but without the InfiniBand logic. And um, you can, you know, he, Happy was saying at the beginning, you know, now cloud is getting to a point where uh, you, you can effectively use uh, InfiniBand, um, but you can get you can get very good performance from from these um, these fast Ethernet um, cores. Um, using uh, using RDMA, uh, so yeah, th th these things have uh, up to now been used a lot more in sort of big data clouds than InfiniBand um, because the support for like, Ethernet is is is, um, is so good, and so yeah, we still have this ten gigabit per second access network to to, to Sanran. Um, and then uh, the Ifu project was was uh, a, a response to a Teresa call for proposals uh, for uh, tier two center uh, to complement um, the tier one center CHPC, uh, and this um, we had a, a partnership um, with uh, various uh, universities in um, in the Western Cape uh, and with uh, what is now Surrey and was then SK uh, South Africa. Um, and also with uh, 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 Sol Petty University um, as an additional partner uh, to, uh, to, to uh, support a range of types of universities. Um, and yeah, the, 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 the funding or, or application is mainly based on um, uh, astronomy and bioinformatics, because that's very much where our, our core expertise was. Uh, and there was a general research data management component to it. Uh, but then Derisa funding was combined with other funds um, so that we ended up with a much larger system than we would have done otherwise. And so in 2018, we added uh, more nodes um, and, and um, uh, yeah, a lot more nodes and started to, to, to build out the storage. Um, and we still extended out our 50 gigabit per second because we were, I, I don't know if I mentioned that we were running, we were running our, our core network at 50 gigabits per second. You could run at 100 gigabits per second, but it's just, uh, uh, that just means you need to buy twice as many switches. Um, 
And yeah, other than that, we just, we just continued building out. And uh, yeah, since then we've, we've continued with that um, and added more uh, storage. Uh, and we've also replaced our edge switch to uh, support a hundred gigabit per second connection into SANREN now, now that Dave updated. Unfortunately, <laughs> the other end of uh, that connection, which is uh, in um, SANREN uh, room at, uh, at CHPC, um, they're waiting for a, 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 an upgraded uh, router. Uh, so, so we're actually still running at 10 gigabits per second, which is starting to become a bit of a problem with uh, the data rates we're seeing from, from telescopes. Um, and we also uh, did some modifications given the, the, the size of the, the, the system was getting uh, bigger. We, we, we made um, uh, some changes to the network topology uh, and we actually also made some, uh, some changes to the way we, we had the switches configured, which actually gave us quite an advantage. So yeah, one, one issue with using ethernet rather than InfiniBand is that people are not so used to running ethernet in these clusters. Uh, or in clusters, they're much more used to using it on, on WANs. And so, yeah, he, 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 I've also said, hey, we use the initial nodes now for, for testing, um, and uh, that, that's very useful to us. Uh, and so that's what we currently have in terms of, of, of uh, hardware at the bottom there, a little over 4,000 cores, and, and, and 10 petabytes of disks of various sorts, um, but that results in, in you, you get roughly half of that is being usable in the end. And that's just what we're using one side of the data center. Uh, and uh, yeah, we still have some space there, and but I'll say more about other things later. So um, the, uh, yeah, I've already said it's, it's, it's OpenStack for managing um, the environment. And we do have some groups, I think there's, there's, there's five groups that manage their own virtual machines and set up their own uh, clusters for, for, for particular applications. Um, but a lot of them actually use VM uh, environments managed by the Lufu support team. And then you, you might say, well, why, why have we got uh, <laughs> uh, infrastructure as a service? But it, it does, you know, the infrastructure as a service does give us the flexibility to, to, to partition the system up in, in ways that we, uh, we couldn't do with just a simple bare metal provisioning. Uh, and then we maintain, we, we maintain VM images and, and, and snapshots of various configurations uh, so that uh, new computing environments can be deployed very quickly. Um, and, and nowadays we have um, Manila, which is, uh, uh, allows users to actually create new shared CephFS file systems. Uh, I think it can be used for some other uh, file systems, not just Ceph now, but uh, Ceph was, was one of the early uh, uh, file systems that had an adapter for Manila. Um, and then we have user level uh, clusters and Jupyter. We have clusters for different purposes. Uh, and then Jupyter uh, Lab and Jupyter Hub provide the main user level uh, environments. Um, and then we, we have a, a library of, of um, soft singularity containers uh, that provide uh, people with software packages and we can keep on updating those. And then we're using data, uh, so we're using uh, Globus for user uh, data transfers. And then we have um, a grid FTP servers being used for the, the big um, uh, uh, astronomy in data. Anyway, that's just what, what OpenStack looks like, but, uh, as you <laughs> probably know. Um, that's what our OpenStack looks like. And then I'll just give an example of, of what's really you know, nice about having uh, a, an infrastructure uh, as a service cloud. So this is, this is uh, an application that's being developed by IDEA along with uh, a couple of uh, international partners. Um, and it's a tool that's highly optimized for remote visually analytics of, of radio data. Um, and it, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it, it basically splits out uh, the, um, uh, the processing that's needed to be done uh, on, from on the front and the back, depending on whether you're mostly interested in, in high, the late, low latency, which you do on the front end, uh, or if you want the, the heavy uh, processing power uh, and access to the large data stores on the back end. And then on Elifu, we, we actually host multiple versions of, of this um, software where, uh, and you know, having, in, having the uh, 
the uh, infrastructure as a service um, uh, allows, allows us to uh, a lot of flexibility in, in creating um, these uh, these virtualized environments to, to host these different uh, for these different cases. So something that has been talked about a few times is, 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 is federation, and, and um, so, so we we have we're actually now in the EGI, the European Federation, which might seem a little strange, but um, uh, they have uh, EGI have a pretty sophisticated uh, setup, and um, we uh, and yeah, we've been working with them some time, and so. With this, you really want um, your, your search teams are often using um, systems distributed across continents uh, and you know, really want research projects to be able to manage uh, access to resources uh, without having to keep on going back and forwards with system administrators. Uh, and also as a resource provider, we want to limit the amount of user account information uh, that we manage because uh, you know, it, it can uh, lead to being hacked if you have old passwords sitting around and it can um, be, um, uh, and it just, just uh, it can just grow <laughs> and be difficult to, to actually weed out you know, what's valid and what isn't. And so we first uh, had our system accessible through the EGI development um, authentication uh, uh, identity management systems um, a couple of years ago. Um, but it, now we're actually part of their production uh, system. And, and this was work done as part of, of uh, EGI ACE project, which is an EU funded project. Uh, and we're also doing some other things in that project with EGI's and, and it's, it, it's good experience for us. And so, you know, how this works is they have this check-in service, which uh, you can access many identity providers. Uh, and so I can actually, I can log in through my UCT account um, to the uh, EUFU system, but I can also log in through my a Google account. But they also have, they're using co-manage, which is an internet two tool, uh, which manages groups of users and team user groups can self-manage themselves. Um, and, um, uh, and then by linking these groups, uh, virtual organizations in EGI speak uh, to tenants in the, um, uh, in the EUFU cluster, um, that, that, that means that uh, these groups can manage access without having to interact directly with uh, our support teams. Um, and we'll be adding this to other uh, portals as, as we go along. And anyway, I just had some shots of that, but not very interesting, just showing how logging in. Um, just some observations about, uh, uh, about running, or running these systems. Um, unfortunately, South Africa doesn't have um, a trusted certificate authority, uh, an ITF International Grid Trust Federation certificate authority, and um, it, with our work with uh, with um, EGI, and, and this would be true if we worked with sites in other countries as well, uh, we needed certificates, and something that really slowed us down in that project. Uh, was having to um, to find ways of getting uh, trusted certificates because we don't have a CA in this country. Um, and I know that uh, Tennis is, is working to see how they, they can solve that, but, but it, it is a challenging issue. Um, I also say that managing a production open stack cluster without a uh, commercial support contract uh, requires very skilled system admins, so uh, you know, be, be aware of that. Uh, and they, they do a lot of testing to bring new uh, core components into the production system. Um, and uh, one example of that is the, the, the bare metal provisioning uh, took an awful lot of work to, uh, and testing to get it to work alongside our virtual uh, machine environment um, due, to, due to networking incompatibilities. Um, so yes, we're, we're, because we wanted to use the same deployment scheme as we use with our VMs rather than go over to something like um, the Stack HPC system, which is very much focused at, 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 at the bare metal provisioning. Anyway, that, a lot of testing was, was required. And I'm just saying the, the availability that we have of, of sandbox test system, which are our initial art nodes, is, uh, is very uh, important. And so we're planning hardware uh, upgrades to, to uh, but you know, that will depend on funding. Um, and as the warranties start, start expiring on these systems, we will consider uh, them for retirement. Uh, so we will, won't be adding new systems, we'll go forward. Um, and, and a good thing about retirement of systems, um, it's, it's various advantages, but it will reduce the heat load in the room because we're, we're 
getting close to where uh, more uh, cooling capacity would need to be added. So, so we may be able to just keep a balance of, uh, of uh, replacing uh, existing machines with more efficient machines. And we're also probably going to go to Keepler. We've been experimenting with it for us in the single sign-on. It's not, not definitely we will do that, but uh, uh, that, that could give a slightly smoother experience to, to um, work between our different services. Uh, and we're also going to add more uh, support, more, support more science gateways. Uh, and I said here we, we want to work with Nikki's to on a enhancing federation of, 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 uh, uh, of South African resources. And we've had several meetings with them over, over the years, but I, I, I think we need to uh, step up that uh, activity again. Um, just, you know, I said you need highly qualified personnel. And uh, so I'm just mentioning <laughs> these people who were the main people who, uh, who, who managed to get to our, our, our systems uh, working and, and running through the uh, running and, and staying in production over time. So uh, several of them are now in uh, different places. Um, but anyway, I just uh, thought I'd list those people just to, to make sure uh, they get some, rec uh, some recognition. Um, so the uh, Lufu cluster running OpenStack hosted at, um, at UCT and, and that system has been in production since uh, 2015. Um, yeah, and it's been expanded over time using funding from different sources. Uh, and so the NIH funding is, is, the, is the bioinformatics, uh, is some of the bioinformatics funding. And then IDEA is our organization has, and then, then, then Dorisa obviously had, had uh, this, this funding through uh, our, our grant. Um, and I said, it does focus mainly on astronomy and bioinformatics. It uh, does, sorry, I've got somebody just trying to talk to me while I'm in the middle of giving a talk. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, but, but we, it really depends on our, on our, our partners, so, so, so we do support other things as well. Um, yeah, and based on, you know, funding, we, we need to, to, to renew and, and replace bits of the system. Uh, you know, meerkats uh, get to be expanded, so that, that will require uh, create um, bigger baselines and more data. And then SK1 is coming along, um, and also uh, there's a new DSI Africa bioinformatics program that we need to uh, make sure that we support adequately for their various um, uh, activities. So that was it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Prof Simmons. I can see you've been very busy. There's a lot of things on the go. It looks quite exciting. I, I, some people have been very busy. I, I try and keep out of the way. No, no, it's not, not quite true. But <laughs> no, no, there's a lot of, uh, it is a lot of work. And uh, yeah, you shouldn't just assume, yeah, that this is easy unless you, you, unless you have commercial support. It's much, you know, it's quite, it's not so hard to do something just, uh, just for your own uh, use. But when it's a production system, um, then a, a lot of work is required. Wonderful, thanks. I think we've got about two minutes or so for questions. Maybe we've got, I don't know, is there anyone who would like to ask uh, Prof Simmons anything? Are there any questions for him? And I'm not seeing anything. Maybe um, I just have a quick question. Um, in terms of funding, um, is there, maybe can you just give us a, a very brief um, breakdown in terms of um, how you're funded and who your main funders are? Sure. I mean, so, so obviously the first part of the system is completely funded through UCT and then um, IDEA itself is funded by uh, its partner organizations, and, and so that, that includes um, UCTWC uh, and uh, UP. Um, and yeah, we, 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 we do get some support for, 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 um, uh, for personnel from Soreo, because uh, we're doing you know, a huge amount of, of, of uh, Meerkat uh, processing. They do the initial processing there at their SDP center, Science Data Processing Center, uh, but then a lot of the uh, further analysis done by us. Uh, but then, um, yeah, through through NIH, various funded projects uh, have come along and, and we 
um, we have a model where uh, you know we, we will expand out our system uh, and uh, give people uh, uh, access proportionate to uh, to their contributions uh, as as sort of a guaranteed thing because otherwise you need to go through a, 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 some a, one of the uh, uh, resource allocation processes to to, to get uh, any large amount. Wonderful. Thanks for that. Okay. Do you have about one more minute left? Is there anyone else with a question? Uh, I'm not seeing any here on the on the chat. I, I should add, of course, that Teresa did contribute. So <laughs> I forgot that list, but that, that, that is, uh, yeah, that's the, the reason I'm here. <laughs> yes. Wonderful. Thanks. Okay, wonderful. Thanks. Thank you, Prof. Simmons. I really appreciate um, your talk, and it's really good to see that, that there are a number of things on the go and things are happening. and and I wish you and your team the best going forward. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Great. So our next speaker is um, Prof. Anneli Smuts from UP. And she has a talk that um, maybe is in the program has not been correctly um, identified. But the name of this is Collaboration of Human and Machine for Knowledge Work. Um, Prof. Anneli, let me just introduce her quickly, her bio. Thank you very um, much. Is, she's an Associate Professor at the Department of Informatics, which is actually a sort of sister department to where I am at UP. Um, and then during her tenure in industry and her role, she's aimed to deliver consistent customer relevant, uh, relevance across all digital touch points and empowering customers through convenient and effective self-service and drive growth through personalized digital offerings and adjacent ecosystems, which sounds quite interesting. Um, her current lecturing and research focus, and you can see that over here in her focus, she looks specifically at Society 5.0, digital transformation, big data management, artificial intelligence and knowledge management. And uh, as of recently, um, uh, Anneli's been, um, appointed as a deputy chair mm -hmm. of the knowledge management KMSA board and she's also published several papers and book chapters um, in, in these fields that I mentioned before. So thank you. Thank you. Without further ado, over to you, Prof. Thank you so much um, for the introduction and for the wonderful opportunity to be here. I just wanted to confirm that you can see my screen, please. Yeah, you can, you can see, see it. Awesome. Thank you so much. So, so colleagues, um, by the introduction, you would have seen that um, I worked in industry until 2017 before I joined the university. And I guess that that influenced and informed um, my thinking a lot around um, evidence based decision making or data driven decision making. And you'll see today, I would like to make the case for a collaboration between industry and academics um, in terms of solving business problems. Um, and I want to try to illustrate my, my argument by uh, using three, three case studies. So what I would like to discuss today is uh, four aspects. The first is just a quick introduction to um, the concepts that I want to share with you. Um, I would then want to look at uh, what is the key question in terms of uh, combining um, knowledge in people and knowledge in machines for knowledge work. I want to highlight the key opportunities and then hopefully there is time for three, I've, I've got three case examples just to at a very high level show you or to hopefully illustrate um, the thinking behind um, the, the lens of knowledge management as, um, as the hook, if you like, to combine the knowledge in people and the knowledge in, in machines. So <clears throat> about this, um, image here. I don't have to. I don't have to say um, a lot because this is, I guess, what um, what what we talk about a lot, what we deal with. But the revolutionary advances in science and technology um, has um, impacted um, the workplace. Well, it it informs a lot of our research areas, um, and the the. Uh, uh, biggest impact, impact in, with regards to what, what we refer to as the fourth industrial revolution is around the complexity that organizations need to deal with. 
Now, the complexity um, sort of in general or in the domain that I want to talk about today is referred to as knowledge work. As a collective perspective, it's referred to as knowledge work. And um, this is based on the premise that um, the knowledge work requires individuals to apply their cognitive abilities to solve higher level problems. And this evolution in technology has um, amplified or has um, um, uh, placed a, a, a larger or a bigger requirement on people to actually, uh, and employees to, to address this. Moving now to society five, um, which is a human-centered society or the super smart society, cyber physical society that we, that we refer to, um, the uh, growing use of the technologies has um, created or has provided the opportunity for a lot of new business models to, to evolve. Um, and to, to a large extent, some of the, the speakers before me actually alluded to this, to this aspect. Um, obviously, when you look at these new business models, it is about creating value um, and about making a profit and about generating more revenue and about providing good customer experience um, if we think about the organizational context. So the technologies assisted us with this. If we just think about um, computer-based algorithms in terms of the cyber physical systems like um, autonomous vehicles, for example, this connected world that we live in, um, that you, you buy online, you use your banking online. So um, internet of things, when you talk about smart cities, one of the case studies that I want to share with you today is, is about smart city. Um, On-demand computing, um, computing power, I've just, the speaker just, in, just before this actually um, illustrated that um, very clearly. And then obviously cognitive computing, um, which is, is um, uh, what I would like to also illustrate today in terms of using artificial intelligence and then machine learning models. So all of this society five human centered society impact in terms of technology um, is about the context of knowledge and, and how we define knowledge and how intelligent mas machines are altering and changing the knowledge that traditionally only used to be in, in, in people's heads. The other aspect that is driving this redefinition of knowledge is data and big data. Um, again, the speaker um, just before me spoke about huge data sets. So these big data um, data sets um, provide additional evidence, if you like, um, that decisions may be derived or, of, or that may be transformed into knowledge, again, redefining the way we perceive knowledge, um, in terms of providing the evidence or the guidance for data-driven decision-making. So if we look at the um, um, impact, if you like, or disruption, um, if you like, then it's, from, uh, then it's relevant from several aspects. Um, the human computer interface or the way uh, that we've changed human computer interfaces significantly changed. Right. Um, if you think about servers using chatbots, service agents, conversational interfaces, um, I want to show you a natural language processing um, interface today that we've used for for one analysis. Significant advances um, in terms of of the technologies that support. Um, and enrich, if you like, this definition of knowledge. But let's quickly see how we changed the, the way that we perceive knowledge. On the left here, you can see the conventional knowledge production process. You can see the physical space, the cyberspace. Typically, data is generated in the physical space. It is stored or saved in cyberspace. Um, we extract a dashboard or we extract um, data based on a particular um, inquiry or, or requirement. Um, humans make sense of that. That goes back into the cyberspace as information, probably a data warehouse. Um, again, humans extract that. I don't know, this the CEO or the, the C-level uh, looks at it. They take strategic decisions to say this is the direction we will take. And again, that is placed back into cyberspace. So that was the old, old uh, definition or the old perception of knowledge. Knowledge production now, you can see a lot less arrows um, in and out between the physical space and the cyberspace, yeah? Um, why? Because a lot of the decisions now do not require human intervention. Through artificial intelligence, 
and um, the application of machine learning models, for example, uh, with its predictive models um, or um, or whatever application, artificial type yeah. application you are using, um, now can take the decision, um, advise, provide insight, and the human ultimately can use that uh, collated and consolidated insight and then um, take the evidence-based decision, yeah? So the knowledge production process, significant disruption or impact on that through the technologies that is now available to us. So it looks like knowledge as a lens to look at data-driven decision-making and particularly the role of data um, in this is worthwhile for us to explore a little bit um, in terms of our topic for today. So let's look at knowledge in organizations. So a knowledge in organization is typically um, based on um, uh, organizational information enriched with huge data sets now, social media data sets, sentiment analysis. Um, it can be video um, just because the technology now enable us to mine structured and unstructured data sets. So if you think about the corpus that an organization has access to now to actually take data-driven decision makings to, de to decide whether I'm going to start, uh, um, uh, kick off a new business model, whether I'm going to generate more revenue, target a different customer segment, and um, significant impact on that. So knowledge work in an organization, huge potential, um, but complexity. Um, in terms of how do we derive the insight out of all of this that is available to us from an organizational aspect. Now, an academic, on the other hand, is a special form of a knowledge worker, yes? Because as an academic, you work with students, you research, you, um, you teach your students. Through your research, you create data sets. And um, in this relationship between an academic and whoever is receiving the information, where you are collaborating with um, a research group to produce research, whether you're lecturing your students, that is a key interaction in terms of, again, data to information to knowledge translation and, and um, enriching this definition of knowledge that we are, are currently talking about. So the key opportunity then is along the following lines. The deep technological change enables organizations to have a huge potential to, based on data, take decisions and take uh, um, evidence-based uh, decisions, right? Not, on, not based on intuition. Um, also, if we look at the nature of knowledge, we've seen now how knowledge has changed and how knowledge is generated. The key opportunity lies in how do we now bring the two together? So human knowledge as well as machine knowledge. And human knowledge, in, for our talk today, I want to talk about uh, organizations um, as, as a source of human knowledge, but also um, academics. So let's explore that a little bit further and just look at knowledge now um, in terms of in, in human and knowledge in, in machines. So uh, typically an organization um, derive insight from the operational systems. They obviously have a customer base. Um, you can collect additional data, there's market research. Um, and uh, um, this, this, these large data sets are uh, collated um, in order to inform decisions, and here you can see to design your products and services, ensure greater flexibility. So there is normally a um, requirement, um, the data is analyzed and a decision is taken, right? However, you know that data can also tell the story. So it's a more of a bottom-up type analysis. So instead of starting with a business problem and trying to resolve that through your organizational data, also look at the story that the data tells. And I guess as academics, that is something that we often work with, a construct that we often work with to look at the data and to see what is the story that the data tell. So between the two in this partnership then, um, I believe is, is one of the opportunities. If we look at the human side of knowledge to say, 
top-down and bottom-up analysis. Look at, start with a business problem, but also look at the story that the data tells. And um, in this um, approach or combining these two together with what technology brings us, uh, that provides the opportunity. So we need to better understand the different constructs um, around knowledge, what constitutes knowledge. Um, and secondly, very importantly, how is data um, um, transferred into knowledge? Now, if you worked with knowledge management theory, you would have known, uh, you would know about the knowledge management um, um, or the knowledge pyramid, data to information to knowledge. There is now um, a discussion around data equals knowledge, right? So how do we transform data um, into knowledge? Because once we're at the knowledge level, I can actually apply, um, apply the data or the translated data and I can take management decisions uh, from that. So let me try to illustrate um, these concepts that I've discussed and the idea of combining the two with, um, with three case examples, three case studies. And Paul, perhaps um, if there isn't time, then I'll just drop one of the case studies, but let's see um, how it goes. So the first case study um, is a collaboration, and this was quite an interesting collaboration that was based on the principles that I've discussed with you and based on this new definition of knowledge. And this was between um, industry um, an, an industry a company here in South Africa and um, uh, our um, department, our academic department. Um, the company had a requirement for a data-driven um, decision-making framework, but they needed to understand the organizational transformation steps. Right. So I think often organizations um, talk about uh, we have to become um, data driven organizations. We need to foster a culture of data driven. Right. But how do you start? Where do you start? So this requirement was based on on, on designing this organizational transformation and framework for data driven decision making. Um, and because I had a data science capability, um, uh, they have a big data um, big data setup, Hadoop, I think, setup, um, where they also had access to the data science aspect of it. So we started um, with our collaboration, um, and we started with two data sets. The first data set was um, uh, collected within the organization. Um, it was a, a basic description across, collected across the entire organization of um, barriers and the challenges to becoming a data-driven organization. On the right, we followed a typical academic structured literature review or a systematic literature review process. And through the formal review process, we created a second um, data set. Um, these two data sets were then combined and the collaborative uh, team then designed a framework for data-driven decision-making. So here you can see the first draft, the first version on the left, you can see the organizational transformation enablers um, through the two data sets. Um, there were four themes identified um, to say, if I have to start now as an organization to become data driven, you need to consider your data platform capability, data management, and you, you can see in each theme, there is some um, sub aspects to it. You have to have a data analytics capability and this ethos, this culture of being data driven you also have to consider that. Um, I have now explained sort of the constructs of data, transforming data to information, to knowledge. If you go, if you look at the knowledge pyramid, it goes all the way to wisdom. And in the initial draft of this framework, we just used um, that as a bit of a, um, I don't want to say maturity level, but a, a mechanism of defining capability. Where is the capability? the data platform capability? Where is the data management capability? Are they already at the knowledge level or is the organization only at the information um, level? So we used the constructs of knowledge um, that I've explained as a bit of a scale in terms of defining this framework. Um, in order to create a bit of a tool to use in the organization, we visualized it as uh, like this, um, you know, as a circle with the four quadrants and the sub themes. And you can see our scale of one to five um, de depicted on this, on this visualization. 
So the organization, a team in the organization then um, applied this suggested uh, framework for becoming a data-driven organization, transformation framework. And we received some, some very good feedback that, it, that they felt that it visualized it well, it was a really easy tool to use, but they found it difficult um, in terms of the definition of the, the different constructs. They needed a little bit more granular uh, definition in order to really add value. And their intention was to use this tool at the departmental level. Also because departments are not all at the same stage. So in the second round in our collaborative process, we then designed um, a more granular um, instrument. And here you can just see a view. Um, so each um, uh, uh, step, each measure from one to five was defined at quite a low level of detail for um, this particular organization so obviously it's flexible you can change your measures depending on your on your application but what this enabled them to do was to use the instrument um, as follows you could create some kind of a measure that you can visualize um, it could now calculate a score behind it for each dimension but also an overall score so typically in this example you can see the overall score or the overall compliance to becoming data driven is 2.25. Um, and um, um, if you look at data platform, that is the, the, more, the most mature in terms of this at a score of three. So um, this provided a, a easy to use tool that they could then apply and use throughout the organization. So from two perspectives, this was a valuable exercise. So from an academic perspective, um, a publication, you know, I, we, we could publish a paper um, regarding this, um, this project and the organization now has a measurement tool that they can use. I've actually spoken to the one line manager earlier today and they are still applying this um, in their different operating companies. So that is case example one. I'm trying to illustrate um, the human side and how we combined the different um, focus, focuses in terms of organizational knowledge and, and academic knowledge, and that we could um, provide a solution for the organization. Um, the second um, case that I want to use to illustrate this concept is um, a, a collaboration um, really um, around a smart city smart city project that was launched here at our university um, in Pretoria. Um, and it is a, it is a, a, a quite a, a big project with, with many streams, but I want to focus on the part, um, uh, the, the knowledge part of it, right? We, we are applying the knowledge management principles and using the constructs that I've explained um, to the benefit of um, decision support for a city, for running a city. So let's look at this a little bit closer. Um, um, this is referred to as the Hatfield Digital Twin Initiative, and it is really focused in an area around the University of Pretoria um, in Hatfield. This just gives you a view of, of the area. Um, of, of this area, obviously the university um, campus is, on, is within this area, and the advantage there is, is that we have easy access to data. Um, we are talking about data-driven decision-making and using data for decision support. So it's a key aspect in terms of access um, to data and to data sets. So the purpose of this digital twin city is to create um, a digital twin of that Hatfield, um, a few blocks of that precinct. Now, from an architect perspective, so there's architects, city planners, engineers, um, all, all part of the bigger, the bigger uh, project. But for us, when we talk about the knowledge lens, it's about decision support. And how can I use um, the data, the story that the data tells for management decisions? Where do we build the next school? Where is there an issue with water, consum water consumption? Um, where should we design a new park, um, et cetera? So what are the typical management um, decisions? Now, the way that we thought about 
then the our part of the project was um, to use a knowledge graph. Now, a knowledge graph is software, um, uh, artificial intelligence software that um, just reads through a large data set and it tries to find um, the, the um, interrelationships within that data set. So basically correlations that we would never have thought about um, would be made visible. So we thought about it in sort of five steps. We, we started with the cyber physical um, aspect around Society5, and I want to show you an additional data analysis set that we've, that we've applied there. Um, the, the cyber physical space informed the notion of a smart city. What, what is a smart city? Uh, how does it operate? What are the um, attributes of a smart city? For us to create that, that digital image of the city, we, we use the digital twin architecture and capabilities. Um, from the data that is now in this digital twin, right, that's digitalized, uh, we can now um, process that, create a knowledge graph, and that would inform um, our decision support for our smart city. So again, you can see that we used the concepts that I've explained about knowledge and transforming data to knowledge um, sort of in this chain of execution. Now, one additional step that I want to show you, which was another aspect of, of um, application of, of these technologies and creating knowledge assets out of that, was an analysis that we've done to look at uh, the Society 5 concepts of smart city. And we, we again did a typical um, a systematic literature review. We analyzed 252 peer review journal articles um, for this topic area. And here we used a tool called Leximancer um, to analyze the data set for us. This is um, a typical, the project control of Leximancer of the software that we used. Um, Leximancer is a natural language processing tool. Um, that so, of course, Mats, you, yes. you have five, five minutes left. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much, um, Paul. I'll just finish this case study and then I'll jump to the conclusion. Um, uh, Leximancer um, typically created um, themes for us um, and through the natural language processing. And I think I was watching it run, it was like one minute and 44 seconds through all 252 um, papers. Um, it identified the main concepts. And this is typically what the output looked like. You can see um, sort of the, the circles, and um, sometimes it overlaps. Um, you can see the theme that is um, indicated in the circle. And I know this is a very busy um, image, but I wanted to show you just the granularity. There's total drill down capability um, through all of this. So if I wanted to, to look at knowledge specifically or network or management, I could drill down um, to the lowest level of detail. And I've just shown you um, some examples of the drill down capability. Here you can see the concept that was rolled up into the themes through the analysis. And this is a typical drill down, the first level of drill down capability. So why did we do this analysis? That was the first two steps of our five chain process to just understand what are the concepts that's involved in a smart, in a smart city on our way to knowledge graphs. The second collaboration was what would typically inform the decision making um, in a smart city. And here we used a concept that was suggested by the architects. Um, and this is uh, based on the donut economics view of a city. So donut economics view of a city gives you quite a lot of indicators. Um, it is based on social foundation, which you can see in the center was I think 12 indicators, the ecological ceiling, which is about seven or eight indicators, and in the center between the two, that is sort of the sweet spot. And that is where the, the perfect city would operate, right? So it's good for the people of the city, but also good for the environment around the city, where the city is positioned. So combining all these different data sets, and now that was a big skip into um, into this view here, you can now see um, the, oh, sorry, let me just go back. You, you can now see the dashboard on the right. You can see typically decision support interface to be able to take decisions at household level, neighborhood level, city level, and then ultimately national level, because we can scale this. Obviously we work in a very small scale at the moment, but the intention is that that is scaled. The smart city measures, second from the right, is informed by the donut economics. And then we could start to map all the knowledge aspects that we found and through the analysis and the data sets. We could start to map to this on our way 
to creating that um, decision support uh, interface. And um, that was the last slide on case on case two. What I'll do in the interest of time, and the, the third one is a COVID pandemic related one, and this is collaborative research and solutioning, but I won't go through all the detail here. And this is really um, building a simulation model. I'll go to this slide here, building a simulation model of the healthcare um, supply chain in, in South Africa, um, in the country, the public and, and um, private healthcare supply chain, and then run certain scenarios through it. There's a spike in infections, or there is a shortage of um, medication, or there's a province closing down, uh, closed down, or locked down, um, etc. So, all to, to be able to run all these scenarios, and again, through translating this data, the healthcare supply chain data that we have into a decision support, the image that you can see on the left here, we enable that evidence based decision making. So, I guess the story or the conclusion of what I wanted to share with you is really about this. From an organizational perspective, we have access to, to data, to too much data sometimes to be able to really take good decisions. From a knowledge worker perspective, we need to understand um, how we derive actionable insight from data. And we are so fortunate to have all of these tools, technology tools available to us to summarize, to work through your large data sets very quickly, all the way up to utilizing this opportunity and to adding value or to making a difference. And, and that's the message that I want to that I want to leave you with, with regards to human and machine for knowledge work. Thank you so much, Paul. Hopefully I finished. With Wonderful, that's perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Great. Smith. Um, I've got a, a question here from um, Kasim yes. uh, in the chat. I don't know if you want to read it or if you want me to read it to um, you. Or, or... Yes, I saw. I saw that. I mentioned academic industry. Students. Yes. He's talking about yes. some work integrated learning or yes, something. Yes, absolutely. So we apply that in two aspects. I totally agree with you, uh, Kasim. The, there's two aspects that uh, that we apply very successfully. The first is um, our second year students, all our engineering second year students have to do community work. And part of the community work is to solve a problem for the community. Um, and they actually work for 40 hours in the community solving that problem and um, using exactly the concepts that we've been talking about now and and a great experience in terms of um, you know the engineers working together with the architects with the technologists in solving in solving that problem for the community the other aspect is our third year students in our uh, department actually um, develops a software solution for a real world client so they actually engage with the client um, they are briefed on the requirement, they do the entire design of the solution, and at the end of the year, they, they deliver a working solution. So again, the feedback that we receive both from industry and from the students, um, very positive in terms of this experience here. Um, and I like the comment here, knowledge transfer partnership, um, which, which, is, uh, which is a wonderful opportunity. Wonderful, thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, you Kasim. I, I hope that addressed your um, your your question. Um, thank you for that answer. I think we've got, we've only got twelve seconds left, so I think we're going to oh, end the session. Good. Let me stop sharing. Um, Kasim says thank you, so I think we're all good. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you, everyone.